From New York City for our viewers worldwide, I'm Lisa Abramowitz in for Jonathan Farrow. A little bit of a softness after hearing from John Williams pushing back or trying to of some of the enthusiasm from yesterday. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Coming up, the Fed fueled rally continuing, or maybe, on Wall Street. Stocks heading for a seventh week of gains as the ECB pushes back against the Powell pivot. We begin with the big issue. Santa, co Santa comes early to Wall Street. Santa did come early this year. Yesterday felt like Santa Claus came to town a little bit. Santa Claus rally. Santa rally. What Chair Powell gave us was probably an early Christmas gift. We got an early holiday present. Obviously, we had the, a bit of a pivot. The idea that the Fed is done raising rates for now. We're finally done with rate hikes. We were very surprised by the dovish tone that Powell struck. He was very dovish in his messaging. Declaring somewhat of a victory lap because inflation is moving down towards their target. This was the first time that he really gave a nod to the trajectory of inflation and the fact that it is easing. We've clearly seen the reaction in markets. A rally across risk assets. Rally in the bond market. There's an everything rally going on right now. Quite a rally. We have right. some room for risk to continue to rally. We're entering next year, I think, with a growing sense of optimism. Joining us now to discuss is BlackRock's Marilyn Watson and Max Kettner of HSBC. Of course, we do have a little bit of a softness, basically range bound after John Williams tried to push back against this by saying that maybe counting in a March rate cut was premature. But Marilyn, I want to start with you. Are you leaning into the Fed pivot or are you trying to step back? Um, so I think certainly you think uh, Powell and the FMC were very, very clear that, um, you know, they've essentially probably come to the end of the rate hiking cycle and that next year, you know, we can expect to see rate rate cuts at some point. I think given the data in the US, um, overall the economy remains still robust. It's on a still on a very, you know, good footing. We are seeing inflation come down and um, the Fed certainly acknowledged that. They acknowledged that, you know, they are um, pleased with the progress that they're seeing in inflation. Uh, there is more to do. But I think certainly, you know, the FOMC did put across a very clear message that, you know, they have achieved many of the things that they expected and they are continuing to see inflation come down. So it really raises this question, do you lean in or do you start to say, well, the economic data has not been completely uh, fully delivered yet? Max, from your vantage point, the rally that you've been calling about, talking about for so long has transpired. Do you start to get a little bit nervous that we're getting toppy? Uh, yeah, good morning. No, I'm not getting a little bit nervous. I'm getting very nervous um, because the problem for me is, and uh, that is perhaps because of my nationality, I don't like to be liked. I don't like when people agree with our view. And uh, the problem really in the last couple of, of weeks is that there's too many people talking about Goldilocks. So it was much more fun at the beginning of this year. It was much more fun over the spring and the summer to talk with clients about what we, why we thought this was continued Goldilocks and what was... Uh, arguing for that. And now when I mentioned the word Goldilocks, all I get in terms of reactions from clients is, well, yeah, fine, we fully buy into that. That is not good. Let's remember one of the key ingredients of continued Goldilocks is that people continue to fight it, is that people always find some sort of stuff that can go wrong, right? Something, some downside factors that can derail that. Whereas all I'm hearing right now is everything's perfect, right? With the Fed pivot now, this is the green light it can only go up from here. Uh, in terms of what we're seeing and, and in terms of our sentiment and positioning indicators, they now almost maxed out bullish. We're on the 95th percentile. It's the first sell <coughs> signal, really the full based sell signals we have since, since the uh, beginning of July. So to us, this is clearly an environment where we don't want to lean into this anymore. Are you actually leaning against it, Max? Are you selling? Yeah, I think you want to start to sell now, possibly not now, right? This is not the moment just now. I think it's for something for the start of the new year. I think it argues for a cautious start to the new year. But right now, the problem is, you know, trading liquidity is too thin. We know that, right? There's not enough people around anymore. Uh, you know, I'm going to be on holiday from Monday. So uh, there is not too many people around anymore. Um, so, you know, what we're seeing is probably mostly driven really by systematic trading now, CTAs and roll target funds. And they aren't maxed out yet on, on their on their positioning, right? So we're probably going to continue to see more momentum now in the next two, three weeks. 
it argues, however, for a cautious start to the new year, and I would argue really for, for a cautious start to the new year across all the asset classes, because I do think that those equity bond or risk on asset class correlations with uh, bond markets are still going to remain very uncomfortably high. And I will talk about your vacation plans in just a bit. But, Marilyn, I'd love your thought on just uh, exactly what he's saying, that essentially people have gotten too comfortable with Goldilocks. We were just hearing from Earl Davis over at BMO uh, Global Capital Markets, and he was saying that he could see 10-year yields retesting 5% next year. Do you agree that basically this is going to be rocky? So I certainly think we're going to continue to see um, elevated volatility, as we've seen throughout this year. Um, partly because of positioning, partly because we have seen uh, all of the major central banks step away, apart from the Bank of Japan, of course, from the incredibly loose monetary policy that they've had in the past few years, which has been suppressing volatility. So as I think as we do see increased price dispersion, also as we do see um, more dispersion in economic data, whether it's uh, you know between the US and Europe or elsewhere, I think we will continue to see more volatility. There are a range, of course, of risks out there that are ongoing including the huge uh, debt burden in the U.S. and other factors as well. But we think if you can position yourselves for a quite high-quality, income-focused portfolio, then you can achieve you know, very, very attractive carry. You can achieve good returns. And there's no need to actually take a huge amount of risk. There's no need to believe in a pure Goldilocks environment. And you can get attractive carry in the, in the belly of the curve. You can add on that securitized um, assets and you can add on, um, you know, investment grades in Europe and elsewhere where we find valuations. So I think it's about being sort of pragmatic and about really focusing on the areas where you can get very decent income or returns and not taking too much risk and not taking too much risk if you do believe there's going to be volatility in a certain sector. Just real quick here, Marilyn, there has been a huge bid to credit, though, and there have been yields coming in to the lowest levels that we've seen going back uh, to early or last year. If you look at investment grade, hasn't it gone too far? So we have certainly seen a massive move uh, in spreads and in all in yields as well. Um, but I think you can, when you look at the underlying um, on a bottom-up perspective, you can still find decent valuations. You can see price dislocations. But I think it's about, again, about having a balanced portfolio. So looking at areas that are more attractive, uh, such as Europe IG, particularly when you would then have the, uh, if, you, if you're hedging it back into dollars. Also, if you look at certain areas of high yield, certain areas of emerging markets. It's not, it's not taking about huge amounts of risk. It's just taking it in, you know, in areas where you do have a high conviction. But certainly when you look at spreads and when you look at the order level in IG, then it has come in a lot. So it pays to be a little bit cautious and just, again, really put the research in and put the time into really understanding the liquidity and understanding the risk reward from any position that you're putting on. Meanwhile, U.S. markets are uh, continuing to rally for the most part off the back of Powell's policy pivot. The S&P 500 closing higher every day this week and poised for a seventh week of gains. Joining us now back for more fun, Bloomberg's Katie Greifeld. Haven't seen you in a while. Katie, what you got? Well, we've been calling it a pivot party. Maybe we can call it a pivot rager because it has just been an extraordinary cross asset rally. And even within the equity market, you can really see the rally broadening out. You're taking a look at the small cap index right now. And as you can see to the right of that chart, it has just been a straight line higher. And this is usually how it goes. I mean, you think about December, you take a look at the outperformance the uh, Russell 2000 typically has against the S&P 500. This is going to plan. A lot of this is being fueled by what we're seeing in the bond market. You take a look at Treasuries right now, your U.S. 10-year yield, we are below 4%. You think about where we were in October, in mid-October, we were just kissing 5%. So the fact that we're one full percentage point below that October peak is really breathtaking. And of course, that move has accelerated this week. Uh, we're below 4% right now. We entered the week closer to 420. But it's not just stocks and bonds. Let's also broaden this out to commodities as well. You think about the moves that we're seeing in Brent. It's been a good week for Brent, up by about 1.4%. This comes after a big leg lower for oil. Uh, whether this is a trend breaker remains to be seen, but we can say definitively that this week has been a good one for the commodity complex as well. Not so much 
if you take a look at FX, if you take a look specifically at the dollar, the Bloomberg dollar index uh, right there, actually that's the DXY rather, uh, over the four month period, uh, we're actually a little bit below, but you can see this move really started in October and it's picked up in recent weeks as conviction grows with the blessing of Jerome Powell himself that the Fed's next move is going to be a rate cut. Katie, thank you so much. As always, there is this big question here about whether the U.S. is still the best place to invest at a time where the Fed is going to be potentially cutting first. So with us, Marilyn Watson and Max Kettner, I, I want to go to you on this, Max. Do you feel like something is shifting and the rest of the world will get more of a bid as the U.S. gets perhaps more dovish than we're hearing from uh, the ECB and the Bank of England? Yeah, normally we would see that, right? So normally it would be quite bullish for things like the UK or Europe, right? So you'd be uh, selling the dollar and buying all, all other sorts of currencies for the carry. But the problem this time around is, actually, uh, if we're defining Goldilocks as an environment where broadly you want to go long carry and long growth in equities, then if you look at G10 currencies, except for the New Zealand dollar, right? The dollar is actually the highest yielding currency. So I'm, I'm not fully buying into this, oh, yeah, the dollar is going to go down another 10 percent or something. And, you know, we're going to see euro dollar at 115, 120. For me, you know, if we go euro dollar towards sort of 110, 112, cable perhaps going to 130, let's always remind ourselves any kind of repricing, such as we've seen over the last hour, you know, driven by the, by the, the Fed's comments or by Williams' comments, um, if we see a little bit of a repricing of those near-term rate expectations, then the one thing that works is the dollar. It will lead to a pretty broad-based sell-off yet again, such as we've seen, for example, in September, October, such as we've seen uh, over the summer, or like in 2022. And the only asset class, the only asset that really works there is the dollar. So I would much rather, going into 2024, use that leg lower in the dollar to start putting on some hedges and buying some topside, actually, in the dollar and going the other way around. Marilyn, what's your sense in terms of uh, whether the dollar is kind of uh, reaching an equilibrium at this point versus poised to weaken that much further if this divergence continues? Yes, I mean, certainly when you look at um, the dollar versus um, other areas, such as if you look at the euro, for example, then we are actually seeing a diversion in terms of economic growth there. So I think it's hard to see uh, the dollar weakening too much in the foreseeable future because the U.S. economy continues to look like it's on a pretty decent, stable trajectory. Um, so I think, you know, if you take the, whether it's the U.K., whether it's the Eurozone or elsewhere, then we are seeing this increased diversion between the economic performance of different regions. And I think overall, the U.S. does look like it, you know, remains on a very stable footing. So it's hard to really see in, uh, you know, certainly in the near future that the dollar would particularly weaken much from here. Marilyn Watson, Max Kettner, both of you are sticking with us. Let's take a look now at the stocks moving ahead of the open. Abigail Doolittle here. Abby. And beneath that relatively benign surface for the S&P 500, Lisa, we do have some bigger movers to talk about, starting off with the shares of Costco. This uh, discount big box retailer reported a solid quarter. They beat profits. They also uh, announced a special dividend of $15, the first one since 2020. They're talking about prices starting to moderate. Now, this is one retailer doing well in the year, up uh, 38% in to today. Intel up 2.2 percent. They've unveiled server and AI chips. The stock was raised to a neutral at B of A. Surprisingly, up 71 percent this year. Well, maybe it's not surprising given the, the rally, but that's the best year since 2003. I guess surprising relative to Intel. And then Lennar down 3.4 percent. They beat. And while the first quarter net delivery numbers were solid, Lisa, they are suspending their full year margin guide around rates uncertainty and other factors. Investors not liking that, sending that one down 4.1 percent in the pre-market. Abby, thank you so much. I thought that was interesting, especially in light of some of the recent discounts that certain houses are being sold at. Coming up, a hawkish pushback from the ECB. Should we lower our guard? We ask ourselves that question. No, we should absolutely not lower our guard. ECB President Christine Lagarde resisting the Powell pivot amid a deepening slowdown in Europe. That conversation coming up next. The risks to economic growth remain tilted to the downside. Growth could be lower, 
if the effects of monetary policy turn out stronger than expected. A weaker world economy or a further slowdown in global trade would also weigh on euro area growth. Should we lower our guard? We ask ourselves that question. No, we should absolutely not lower our guard. Recession odds growing in Europe thanks to weak uh, private sector activity. Euro area PMI is contracting for a seventh straight month in December. In the area's two biggest economies, France and Germany, hit particularly hard by the slump. Still, European central bankers are in no hurry to join Fed Chair Powell's pivot party, even as traders fuel rate cut bets and insist the ECB will have to ease a policy. Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo joining us now with more. And we are hearing from uh, New York Fed President John Williams over here with a little bit of push back trying to walk back a little bit some of the uh, more dovish tone from Jay Powell. Is there the same kind of feeling over in Europe? Uh, yes, and I thought that clip that you played was actually fantastic because it really shows the conundrum that the European Central Bank is facing, where you have the head of the European Central Bank who openly says the risks are tilted to the downside. By the way, she also said if monetary policies are meaning the transmission, the hikes uh, they've done so far, and this is the most, or was at least the most aggressive hiking cycle to date from the European Central Bank, also proves uh, perhaps too strong that could impact the economy negatively. When you look at Friday morning today, uh, we end the week with PMIs, as you say, that once again show this is an economy that cannot catch a breather. We're back to uh, 47. Of course, that shows that the economy is now still in major uh, contraction. But what is important about the numbers that we got today is that it shows perhaps uh, that this theory that the European economy had bottomed out and could only grow from here may not be, in fact, manifesting. So there's still lower room to go. Again, the conundrum, to answer your question from the European Central Bank, is that facing all of that, they are still seeing it is too early to cut their there are no internal debates going on at the European Central Bank to cut uh, rates. In fact, you also continue to say the theme of higher for longer is one that the European Central Bank wants to spend time on because they want to reflect on the data. And this goes back to also some of the criticism uh, from the European Central Bank, which, as you know, there are voices that say when you look at their forecast and you look at the data and the assessment that they make about the economy, they are perhaps a little bit too over optimistic about the resilience of the economy and have not factored yet perhaps how fast inflation is falling down. So there is a risk now, perhaps, that this is an economy that is heading into a slowdown that is now markedly in those PMIs, and yet a central bank that insists we want to stay for the higher for longer theme as long as possible, and most importantly, as long as credible in the eyes of the markets, of course. Wonderful work, Maria Tadeo. Thank you. And what Maria was saying there really dovetails into the market reaction, which is we don't believe you. Marilyn Watson and Max Kettner are still with us. Marilyn, do you agree with the market? We don't believe you, ECB, that you're going to hold on for longer than the Fed and that you're not going to cut rates as soon as March. Uh, yes, I think that's right. And, uh, you know, as you just heard, the PMI data was very weak, particularly in Germany and France, where it's clearly in contractionary territory. Um, it does seem most likely that the ECB will um, end up cutting rates before the Fed. Um, and, you know, yesterday, I think as I, Lagarde tried to strike a very balanced tone. Um, and some of the, uh, you know, the ECB's forecast as well, looking at inflation, for example, were perhaps slightly higher than a lot of people were expecting. Um, inflation is also on a trajectory that's coming down in the eurozone. Uh, the economy is weakening. It was quite interesting today in the PMI data that we did see um, continued growth in um, output prices. That's perhaps more than expected. But overall, I think it, it, it's, it's pretty, you know, it seems pretty clear that the ECB is on, um, you know, a less positive growth trajectory than the US. And it certainly seems that inflation is coming down. And um, it is most likely that the ECB will cut first. And it does seem like people are coalescing around that idea. I'm looking at a 10-year German yield at the, around the lowest level going back to January at about 2%. Max, do you agree with that, that regardless of what the ECB says, they're going to hike first, they're going to have no other choice? I mean, cut first, excuse me. Yeah, I think, look, I guess um, we've seen a few tweaks uh, yesterday, right? We've seen, for example, in the statement that uh, the, the ECB is saying that inflation is, or they've dropped the statement of that inflation is uh, too high for too long, uh, which perhaps is a bit more dovish, right? But of course, also, like I was saying, look, the first half in particular is going to be very rich in terms of the incoming data to watch. So all of that really suggests that perhaps, to us at least, it, yes, earlier cuts. We did anticipate cuts from the ECB only in December next year, and we've brought them about six months forward. 
Um, so they're going to come um, from June in our view and then once per quarter, but not as aggressive as the market is saying. Right? I do believe that some of that market pricing, uh, both with regard to the ECB, but also with regard to the Fed, is really a little bit too much, is a little bit too overdone. And there is a risk right, that in particular, given that we have these really low growth expectations still, both for the US and now certainly also for the Eurozone, right, where consensus growth expectations are much, much lower, that some of those data, most likely more in the US, is going to surprise a little bit to the upside, right? And that will bring perhaps some of that dovish uh, uh, rate pricing out of the market a bit. So, Max, just quickly here, because you were talking about how you would lean against some of the enthusiasm. Where? In Europe? Because you are seeing the CAC and the DAX both at record highs. Yeah, look, it's, it's a broad-based thing, right? Like, let's let's be honest. Um, if we had bought anything between the September FOMC meeting and the November FOMC meeting, there was losses across the board, except for gold. And the reverse happened in the last month and a half. So frankly, I think, you know, in, in a world where correlations are still very close to one, which I don't see changing anytime soon, right? And you have, you have a range of outcomes, really, and a range of potential hedges. But on the downside, the only thing that tends to work, if you have a broad-based sell-off across rates, credit, right, and, and EM and equities, the only thing that tends to work is the dollar. So it's not really something where I'm saying, oh, I want to go short particular sectors or something. No, it's particularly really uh, putting a bit of topside on the dollar, right, buying a bit of topside uh, on the dollar, particularly versus sterling here, because it's a relatively clean risk on currency against any kind of potential uh, uh, declines. Not massive, right? But 5 to 10% in equities at the beginning of the year. Yeah, why not, right? And for that, really, a bit more, uh, uh, a bit higher in the dollar and a bit lower in some of those risk on currencies. Marilyn Watson, Max Kettner, both of you, thank you so much for being with us on a reset moment after a pretty massive week. Coming up, the morning calls and later, stocks heading for their longest winning streak since 2017. That conversation still ahead with Keith Lerner of Truist. You are seeing uh, a bit of a range-bound market as we end out a pretty big week. down to the open. I'm Lisa Abramowitz in for Jonathan Farrow. Time now for our morning calls. A look at some of the analyst recommendations this morning. First up, Wells Fargo upgrading GE to overweight, highlighting the company's clean balance sheet and best in class management. Next up, Bank of America upgrading Clorox to neutral, expecting shares to benefit from a challenging macro environment. And finally, Moffitt Nathanson downgrading Roku to sell, seeing a stretched valuation and mounting headwinds to revenue growth. Coming up, Keith Lerner of Truist expecting a volatile year ahead for stocks. That conversation coming up next. down to the open. I'm Lisa Abramo is in for Jonathan Farrow just moments away from the start of trading and you can see a churn beneath the surface as we try to get some sense. S&P futures lower by about a tenth of a percent really spurred by John Williams coming out trying to walk back some of what we heard from Jay Powell a little bit of a lift though still in Nasdaq and Russell outside of stocks you can see in the bond market again a bit of a reversal on some of those comments 10 year yields just a bit higher retracing from some of the earlier gains that we are uh, earlier losses I should say that we saw earlier just a up marginally 3.93 percent uh, crude hanging on to gains and the euro dollar still lower weaker after being stronger for most of this week a bit of dollar strength as people really assess whether the euro uh, region can uh, avoid cutting rates as soon as March one stock to watch at the open is Costco the company topping earnings estimates and announcing a special $15 dividend Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle has more Abby and on this Lisa we do have this stock up 2.7 percent the best day since May of this year. So shareholders are very uh, happy about those results. That profit beat revenues basically in line. Now it was against tough comps still coming out solid. Traffic was the real contributor here offsetting some declining uh, ticket transaction sizes. They're also talking about seeing moderating prices about flat to up 1% versus what had been up 1 to 2%. They are saying that their strong value added uh, high renewal rates and club expansion plans uh, 
make Costco well positioned. And it's interesting, Lisa, because on the year, Costco is really the best in class for these big box retailers. If you take a look at Target, it's down uh, a little bit on the year. BJ's Wholesale Club basically flat. Walmart up about 7%. We also have analysts excited. Lots of price targets raised on the street and Costco right now up 2.5%. Abigail, thank you so much. It looks like it's the most since May 26, as you were mentioning. Turning now to the automakers, GM cutting more than 1,300 hourly jobs across two plants in Michigan. Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow joining us now from San Francisco with more. Ed. Uh, good morning, Lisa. GM up two-tenths of a percent, 1,300 hourly jobs, which is interesting in the context of it just being a month since they struck that agreement for a new labor contract and it was ratified by its unionized workforce. The majority of the 1,300 are at the Lake Orion plant, about 945 jobs. That's significant because it was where they've been building the Chevy Bolt, which, as you know, will be discontinued, and where they had delayed plans or pushed back plans to build electric pickup trucks there. That will now take place starting in 2025. What I find astonishing, GM now softer a tenth of 1%, but on the week, we're set for a pretty significantly weekly gain. This will be GM's sixth successive weekly gain, its longest run of weekly gains, going back to December 2014. So job cuts, all the chaos with Cruz, its autonomous driving unit, and all the doubt that we have about the real demand for electric vehicles doesn't seem to be deterring investors who have been pushing the stock higher for six straight weeks. Ed Ludlow, thank you so much. Getting back to earnings season, Darden shares under pressure. After cutting its annual revenue forecast, Alex Amanova has more on breadsticks. Alex. Hey, Lisa, good morning. So Darden, Darden Restaurants out with a mixed earnings report this morning. That is the owner of Olive Garden and Longhorn Steakhouse. It reported revenue that fell short of Wall Street estimates while also lowering its guidance heading into the busy holiday period. You can see shares moving down more than 4% into the open this morning. Sales did climb, however, 9.7% from the same period a year ago. It attributed that to an advance in same store sales uh, that removes locations open for less than 12 months. It also attributed that to the inclusion of Ruth's Chris Steakhouse. It acquired that chain back Back in June for $715 million. Same restaurant sales were up 4.1% at Olive Garden and up 4.9% at Longhorn Steakhouse. So that's giving uh, that's giving the results a bit of a boost. Uh, fine dining sales, however, fell 1.7% for the period. So you can see consumers still opting for cheaper dining options. Uh, analysts didn't like that guidance. RBC asked whether this is merely a conservative outlook or if it speaks to a softening trend in recent traffic. And City said the lack of an increase in sales guidance points to a choppier industry that could pause upward momentum in the stock. Shares had been down, uh, shares had been up rather 20% this year. Lisa. Alex, thank you so much. Turning now to the home builders, Lennar shares under pressure due to slightly weaker gross margins on home sales. Katie Greifeld has more. Katie. And shares of the home builder are following this morning after that report. And I will say there was a lot of good news in this report, Lisa. Let's quickly go through it. In the fourth quarter, Lennar beat on EPS revenue and net new orders. And looking ahead, its forecast for first quarter and 2024 deliveries came in above analyst expectations. But if there was something to pick at, it comes on the gross margin numbers. In the fourth quarter, gross margin on home sales was about 24.2%. That is a hair light. And in the first quarter, Lennar sees gross gross margin on home sales between 21 to 21.3 percent. That is below estimates of 22.9 percent, and that is what is dragging the stock lower this morning. But the bar was really, really high for this name. It hit a record high going into this report, and since just the start of November, shares are up almost 40 percent, so a little bit of disappointment today. And up 68 percent since the beginning of the year, Katie. Good perspective. Uh, Truist Keith Lerner looking ahead to next year writing. Entering 2024, we have had a very sharp rally and sentiment is much more bullish. Thus, the bar for positive surprises is much higher, which is exactly what we saw with Lennar. Keith, I'm so glad to say, is joining us now. Given that feeling that you have that the bar is so much higher, do you think that we're set up for some softness heading into January, especially given the rally we've seen over the past few weeks? Yeah, well, great to be with you again, as always, Lisa, especially on this Friday. Uh, you know, first of all, we've enjoyed this rally. We, we put a note at the end of October saying it was a buying opportunity, and we thought small caps and the equal weight index would outperform. So we've seen this big move up, stronger than we even thought at that time, but um, it just shows how oversold the market was, and we've seen this pivot. 
And I do think to, more directly to your question that it likely sets up for at least choppier waters, maybe as we get a little bit deeper into the first quarter. That would be consistent with what happens, what tends to happen during an election year where the first part is somewhat choppier. And then also, if we just think about, you know, where we were a year ago coming into the year, you know, last December, we had about a 7 or 8% correction during December. We had bearish sentiment above 50% on the uh, AAII. And this year, we have, you know, a ramp up, right, 15% up off the lows. Small caps are up 20%. Home builders up over 40%. You just talked about Lennar, but 40% over the last, like, six weeks or so. So I do think that bar is somewhat higher heading into next year. I will say... One thing, though, as you look back over, like, say, the next six months, one thing that's encouraging is that we were able to get so overboard. We did a study, which I can talk about this morning, that shows when you get this overboard, it suggests a little bit of a pause. But when you look at six months forward, the, the, the positive hit ratio is actually pretty good. That's what Neil Dutta actually pointed to this morning of Renaissance Macro. He was saying, actually, when things are overbought, that's usually a good time to buy uh, since it tends to melt up further from there. At that point, though, Keith, are you still aggressively neutral? No, <laughs> I'm glad you remember that. Um, so we've been more tactical, and I would say after this move up, I'm back into that same spot where we've been. And I think that's the story for next year, too, that there will be these tactical opportunities where the market you know, overdoes things when we're talking about inflation, soft landing or, or not, um, You know, whether the, the Fed actually pivots and when they pivot. So I think investors just should be prepared that it's not going to be a year to be on autopilot. We're going to have tactical opportunities just like we had this year as well. And, and not only do we have the election here in the U.S. next year, we have 40 elections around the globe. And, of course, there's going to be things that come up that none of us know, which happens every year as well. Well, Keith, just to talk about the tactical play, because a lot of people are talking like this, saying it's going to be volatile just the way it was this year with similar overshoots. So how do you know we've overshot? What are you leaning back against today, for example? Yeah, well, so I mean, maybe one of the most obvious examples was back at the end of October when, when, uh, when we put out the note about an opportunity. You know, we look at, um, you know, sentiment figures, um, and we also look at the broadness of the decline back at the end of October. You know, the, the broad-based market was down 10 percent. Small caps were down 17 percent. Real estate was down over 20 percent. And some of the sentiment metrics that we looked at was the lowest we've seen uh, um, since the fall of last year during the depths of the decline. So we lean on that. And at the same time, when we look at the sentiment side, we say, you know, what are the fundamentals saying? So one of the things that gave us conviction to have that call was that the forward earning estimates for the overall market was moving forward. So what would we be looking at is same thing. Um, are the earning estimates going up? And are we having more of an emotional move down where we think things are solid beneath the surface? Are the economic trends still stable? From the economic standpoint, I think things to really keep a close eye on into this new year continues to be the initial jobless claims. And then also credit. Credit has been a good tell that as rates have pulled back down more recently, credit spreads have come in. So that tells you that was more of a disinflationary trend less concerns about the economy. Yeah, which really raises this question whether bonds and stocks can continue to rally together. And it, that's been sort of the trend for a while. It's gone so on steroids recently over the past few weeks. Yeah. Can it continue? Well, you know, it's interesting. Just, just yesterday, after this move down, uh, we were overweight duration. We went neutral duration, at least from a short-term perspective, show, you know, moving that uh, as, as rates have moved down to 5 to 390. Uh, we still think Bonds ultimately go low over the next year. We just think that's moved pretty quickly. And to your point, um, one of the, the big fuel for the market has been this move down in yields. So that's another reason I, I think to expect as we move into the new year, probably more a little bit of a digestion uh, period before the market tries to make another leg up. And to your point, that study that we did, we looked back since 1980 when, when we seen the RSI, which is the relative strength um, index, right? commonly you can look on your Bloomberg, you'll see it there. It went above 79. And we went back um, the last 23 times it's happened since 1980, 21 out of 23 times, six months later, you were higher. But on the shorter term, you were somewhat more mixed. And that's typical of these kind of overboard, overstretched index. Uh, and that lines up with a 10-year also now probably more likely to consolidate and be less energy or fuel for this market than it has been over the last six weeks. I guess that this goes to the heart of the question that a lot of people have been asking and trying to answer, which is, is 60-40 dead? Is it coming back? Can it be reliable? How do you sort of frame your investments with the idea of bonds as a hedge to risk? Yeah, well, listen, I, I think the 60-40 is in a much better place than it's been um, for the last several years, simply because the, uh, the interest rates are still higher than they have been. The reason why the 60-40 had a problem it was that there was no coupon, so you didn't have that cushion, at least now, and I, maybe it's not as good as it was you know, a month ago, 
but you're still at you know uh, close to four percent on the ten year. So I, I still think that will be a, a positive. Um, uh, you know, altogether the sixty forty is, is still still works. And don't forget the expense ratio to get access to these things is a lot lower than it's been historically as well. But on top of that, I do think there will be times where we'll have to be more tactical as far as where we invest within fixed income, where we invest within equities, and that's where we can help smooth the ride out. And also, maybe outside of this, alternatives and things of that nature. Meanwhile, we are seeing a bit of reversal, but really no drama this morning after New York Fed President John Williams uh, in an interview said, we aren't really talking about rate cuts, just sort of the way that Jay Powell is talking about. We aren't really talking about rate cuts. He's saying also it's, quote, premature to be thinking about cutting interest rates in March. Keith, do you buy it? You know, we've been thinking that they were going to raise more in uh, the middle of the year. You know, another thesis was, you know, I'll be, to be candid, I'm, I'm, I'm rethinking a little bit, is we, we've been thinking the Fed would have scar tissue from this inflation that got out of hand over the last year, and they would, their reaction function would be somewhat slower. Powell kind of, you know, talked against that. Um, so I, I think the rate cuts are likely coming. We've been, we're still in the camp that it's likely maybe later than March, but I think the more important message for the market is that, that they are likely coming and that the Fed has said something important is that, they're they're more focused on the you know the um, you know inflation coming down. They're more focused now on keeping this economy out of recession. So I think they are coming, but again, maybe March may be a little bit pre premature in our view. Keith Lerner, you're sticking with us. Coming up, Secretary Yellen gearing up for a trip to China. America's fundamental economic strength means that we have nothing to fear from healthy economic competition with China or any other country. China's economic recovery losing momentum, adding pressure for another round of stimulus. That conversation up next. There are some breaking news uh, crossing the terminal having to do with economic data. Let's get the details from Abigail Doolittle. Abby. Indeed, Lisa. We do have the U.S. PMIs crossing the terminal right now. The preliminary numbers for the month of December basically mixed to in line uh, relative to the overall composite, though, slightly hotter than expected. The survey had expected 50.5. It came in at 51. That's above November at 50.7. Relative to the breakdown for manufacturing coming in at 48.2, a a little bit below the estimate uh, and a little bit below November. So some cooling for these smaller to medium sized companies for the month of December so far. Relative to services, though, up a little bit, up 51 at 51.3. Uh, overall, above 50. So the economy per these U.S. PMIs, the preliminary for December, Lisa, showing a little bit of expansion for the economy. Abby, thank you so much. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen planning to visit China again in 2024. On the agenda, discussing what she labeled different Difficult areas of concern, including outbound investment, sanctions, and national security. This is China's economy continues to slacken. November data trending downward year over year. The central bank injecting a record amount of cash into the economy in an attempt to offer some relief. For more, we have Kaylee Lyons in Washington. Kaylee. Well, Lisa, if you look at this data, the comparison really isn't fair because, yes, you did see an expansion in terms of industrial output and retail sales. But what we're comparing to is a year ago when the economy was being severely hampered by COVID lockdown. So analysts say, actually, when you are comparing to more typical periods, yes, these numbers were down uh, last month. There also is, of course, the issue of China's property sector. Property development investment has fallen 9.4 percent this year, according to government figures, which is why you are seeing more calls here for stimulus. Yes, the PBOC overnight did have that record $112 billion cash injection in terms of uh, its one-year loans uh, commercially. But it just underscores that more may need to be done here and that China is really feeling economic pressure as home, as it also, at, at home rather, as it also faces economic pressures coming from U.S. policy. And that really is what Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen was talking about last night. Yes, she said she is going to try to continue normalizing these relationships, areas of communication and cooperation, which is why she is planning on making another trip to Beijing next year after she did did so 
earlier this summer, as we have seen a number of administration officials do, and of course the meeting with President Xi Jinping and President Biden in person in San Francisco just last month. But Yellen also was taking some shots at China here, talking about national security issues, the idea that there is not a level playing field for U.S. businesses because of what she deems unfair economic practices. So there are still areas of confrontation. She said that the U.S. still intends to continue pursuing export controls uh, as well as restrictions on investment into China. At the same time, though, they do want to have uh, collaboration in some areas. And she reiterated the messaging we hear consistently from this administration, which is that the U.S. is trying to protect national security interests and compete with China in a healthy way, but is not, Lisa, seeking to decouple. Kaylee, thank you so much. And a lot of this is being fueled by the business community that is trying to understand what the groundwork is for them to participate in the Chinese economy, the second biggest in the world. Still with us is Keith Lerner. And Keith, I'd love to get your view on how much you can lean into this idea that there could finally be a recovery in China, the story that did not materialize in 2023, but could become one in 2024. Well, I think that could be an upside surprise, but I will say, color me skeptical. Uh, we have zero exposure in emerging markets in our portfolios. And part of that reason is because uh, you know, China represents over uh, oh, about 30 percent of the index. And we've had that position since early last year. And I, I think what you have to be uh, careful about is for the first time, really, in the last 20 or 30 years, we're seeing foreign direct investment leave China. And I think every business owner that is doing business there just has to say, do I want to have all my eggs in one in, in one?" place and you're going to see more diversification out of China. The other thing that's interesting more from a market perspective, we talk about tech being the big catalyst this year for the main headline markets. Well, the Chinese tech companies are, um, are closer to the lows than the highs. And that's because of the crackdowns we saw a few years ago. Profitability uh, is not nearly the same as well. So maybe, you know, some of that stimulus helps stabilize the economy as well. And maybe that's a bit of an upside surprise. But overall, from an investment standpoint, um, we are skeptical. And if we were, if we thought that was going to be a lift, we might be more interested in playing you know, part of Europe as a trade partner as opposed to China directly. That's where I was going to go. How much does this really affect your call on Europe? It doesn't. And the other thing I will say, when we think about if, this, you know, let's say the global economy is stronger and the U.S. economy is stronger, I think the other thing you can think about is, do I want to play Europe? Or is a better place to be is U.S. small caps or the equal weighted index? Really, that's what we would say it would be the, the latter, where you would want to be in the, uh, the um, you say, Europe is that you're really making a call on the currency. We think the dollar is more in a choppy range that continues. If you were more bullish about the euro, then maybe that's a better place to be. But we think even now you're seeing during the cyclical rebound, the equal weight, small cap, cyclical U.S. is outperforming Europe, and we would stick there for that, that exposure. What's the thinking behind staying in the U.S. and trying to gain exposure to these other stories, but solely through U.S. investments? Is it just that it's a more reliable legal and other uh, an economic framework than, say, a place like China? Or is it because just simply the number of scenarios that benefit the U.S. and all of the assets therein are so much more plentiful than the others? <laughs> I just think it's you know, a high quality universe in general. And I don't want to say there's not opportunities overseas. There certainly are. There's, a, there's more companies overseas than there are in the U.S. So I want to be clear on that. We do have international investments. We're in developed international. We're just much, much below our kind of benchmark weightings. And again, I think we, we, we share some skepticism um, as far as investing directly in China because of the profitability side. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll change our view if the profit trends overseas improves. And a lot of times when people invest, you're not investing in the economies of these of these countries. You're investors in, in, in uh, companies and the sector composition makes a big difference. Uh, if you look at Europe relative to the U.S., you have a lot more Europe. You have European banks being much bigger allocation in some of those indices and technology, you know, much less. So if we turn more negative on tech or or investors are more negative on tech, more likely some of these other areas in the developed world will do well. I mean, Japan's acting better as well. So, again, there's opportunity there. But I, I just think there's a way to play that cyclical exposure through higher quality uh, companies within the U.S. directly. Um, and that's how we're playing it today. But, again, we're trying to keep an open mind as we move over the next year. Keith Lerner, thank you so much. Have a wonderful holiday uh, if I don't speak with you uh, before then. Coming up, the market moving events that you need to be watching. That's next in our trading diary. What you can see is a bit of softness on the S&P, strength on the NASDAQ, strength when you could see uh, is still in a number of different asset classes. This is Bloomberg.
is Bloomberg The Open. I'm Lisa the Abramo. It's time now for the Trading Diary. But before we get there, I just want to say uh, the Nasdaq really climbing in that haven bid. Coming up, a Bank of Japan rate decision on Tuesday. Micron earnings after the closing bell on Wednesday. Thursday, we'll get U.S. GDP and another round of jobless claims, followed by quarterly results from Nike. And finally, U.S. bond markets closing early for the holidays on Friday, as everybody does go away uh, for the holidays and to start the new year right Right now, people are churning, trying to digest what John Williams said, trying to push back, saying that the market was overpricing the chance of a March rate cut. Not really denting the toothpaste kind of out of the tube. This was Countdown to the Open. This is Bloomberg.